Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in our Advances in Autism Research and Care webinar today. Um, a few housekeeping topics. Um, you should see a little navigation bar on the right side of your screen. And if, if any questions come up during the presentation, please feel free to type them into the questions box. And then I will ask any questions that we get um, as long as we have time at the end of the presentation. Um, usually we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So if anything comes up during the presentation or after, please feel free to write them down right there. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to welcome our network medical director, Dr. Dan Corey, to present our presenter for the day. Great. Thanks very much, Megan. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Andy Scheer, Senior Vice President for Public Health and Inclusion with Autism Speaks. Uh, Andy has training in, in molecular cell biology and initially started his work in autism with studies in gene identification and characterization, but a decade ago started to focus more on the Autism Speaks Global Autism Public Health Initiative, uh, which works to provide technical support around the globe. Today he's going to present to us some of the work that he's doing in uh, many different countries and update us on the status of uh, autism spectrum disorders uh, around the world. So I'll turn this over to Andy. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Hello? Hello? Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm not. Hi, Dan. Yeah, sorry. Okay. You sound great, Andy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so yeah. I want to thank Megan and the organizers again for giving me this opportunity uh, to share a little bit of what we do uh, at Alton Speaks in terms of public health in our global effort. Um, and of course, thank you, Dan, for that very kind introduction. Um, so let me just first start by showing this picture. Uh, it's a handsome group of people. Uh, and this they, they are the members of Alton Speak Advocacy Leadership Network. And uh, among this group, there are uh, politicians like Congress and Chris Smith in the front row. Uh, there are former first ladies um, right there. You got Albania and Maldives. And uh, you have policymakers, advocates, professionals, and family members uh, from all over the world in this network. So indeed, OK, here we go. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna talk about is really the, about the importance of community engagement and innovation and the lessons that we have learned from the field over the past 10 years. Um, so this group of uh, individuals comprise Advocacy Leadership Network and they are really a global uh, network of accomplished advocates that we have met in our travels, in our work. And they are uh, respected local leaders with track record for innovation and facilitating, facilitating change. Um, and they are uh, from all walks of life, and uh, and we are interacting continuously on social media, and um, but we do have annual meetings to facilitate knowledge exchange and transfer and collaboration, and this group has been together now for eight years, and um, it does some high impact network collaboration, including the uh, the passage uh, facilitating the passage of World Health Assembly resolution that we'll talk about uh, shortly. Uh, so currently there are 52 countries that are member of the LN. Uh, uh, actually, a little bit more now. This is the 2016 grab, and uh, and this gives you a sense of the people that are in this uh, network. So this is the first uh, LN meeting in 2010. We had 23 country in the front row. You see uh, Authors Big Founder Bob Wright and Suzanne Wright, and this is the one the meeting that we had uh, two years ago uh, in Washington D.C. It's a third annual meeting, and there are 45 country present. So I think you can see just a tremendous increase both in terms of members as well uh, membership as well as diversity of membership in fact uh, this here are some pictures from the event that give you a nice uh, sense of the mix uh, at ALN so in this picture alone we have representatives from Argentina Peru Tanzania Zambia Ghana Kenya Nepal and Malaysia um, and we talk about things like how do you advocate if you don't live in a functional democracy uh, the lady standing up is from Russia uh, she runs a foundation there um, and we also have a uh, network member like uh, Felicity Shosho Ngugu uh, from On Society of Kenya, uh, who is not shy at all about giving her assessment of the government's performance or lack thereof uh, in Kenya. 
this shows a, uh, a, a school that was a classroom that was uh, 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 put together by On Society Kenya. It's really just a concrete room uh, inside of a public school uh, that's been refurbished by ASK uh, members. And there are, there are two kids there, and they're there all day with nothing else but this, uh, I guess, a babysitter or teacher. Uh, this is uh, uh, from network member in Ethiopia, uh, Addis Ababa, and the uh, Joy Center for Autism. Uh, you see the, uh, the restraint on the child. Uh, but, you know, this is actually a coping strategy for many of the caregivers there because they're unable to leave the, uh, the child alone. So what they try to do is to do their best to accommodate uh, the needs of the child while they have to go about their daily routines. Uh, here's a, uh, a group of pictures of, uh, of a state psychiatrist uh, from Kazakhstan. Uh, currently, um, and this gives you a sense of the challenges we're dealing with, uh, only state psychiatrists can render the official autism diagnosis. And I have some fairly surreal experiences where speaking to one of the state psychiatrists, not in Kazakhstan, but in a neighboring country, who insists that out of the population of 5 million, there's only 72 members uh, affected by autism because she personally diagnosed every one of them. Uh, this is a replica of a small town uh, <clears throat> yeah, that was built in Danam, Saudi Arabia uh, by the oil giant Aramco. And uh, it's, me it's meant to, to teach uh, real world skills like shopping, uh, negotiating uh, restaurants and so on uh, for individuals on the spectrum. Uh, in Albania, Tirana, Albania, um, the, the first lady there uh, was able to uh, uh, fundraise and build a real estate art center in, just outside of the capital city. Uh, this is, sits in the, among the field of cows and chicken farmland, basically, uh, but it really is a, a it's very impressive. It's as good, not better than many of the center I've seen in high-income countries in Western Europe and, and, uh, um, and, and the United States. Uh, but right now, the center is providing services, direct services about training of uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, Here's a conference organized by our colleagues, Autismo in Vila Daji uh, in Brazil, featuring adult, uh, adults uh, on the spectrum uh, doing a performance. Um, another slide uh, that shows a, a center that was uh, developed by the Prime Minister's Office of Malaysia, and uh, is actually a, is a, it's been declared a center of excellence about three years ago, and uh, so it's permanently sustained within the national budget. Uh, this is from 2012, where Alien member Elizabeth Chen, who is a managing director at Goldman Sachs, uh, helped disseminate results of our cost of autism study that the uh, Autism Week funded by Martin Knapp, David Mandel et al. Uh, so the, the, the figure that, uh, that most of us quote these days uh, about the lifetime cost, uh, as well as the uh, total society cost, uh, came from this particular study. Uh, closer to home, this is actually in Flushing, Queens. We're working with the uh, uh, immigrant community um, to understand better helping the behavior and how to encourage uh, uh, earlier, earlier screening and diagnosis or identification among the immigrant population. And uh, uh, from the Korean community in New York City to uh, the Korean community in Seoul, Korea, uh, where we are implementing a program. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the PSC program uh, later on. But what, is, uh, what I love about this picture is that the, the main trainers that were training for the country, about six trainers are actually uh, mothers of child with children with autism. So, so this just to uh, uh, outline overview of what I'm gonna share with you in the next uh, you know, 35, 40 minutes or so. Um, so obviously in addition to advocacy edition, or we'll, I'm gonna try to provide you with some perspective and trends uh, uh, that enable our work in recent year. Uh, including development framework. Uh, the idea of identifying, finding innovation, identifying innovation in community setting. Uh, more about the Global Autism Public Health Initiative that, that Dan uh, uh, alluded to in his introduction. And then I will give you two specific examples of the work that we're doing globally. One is the caregiver scale training program. And then, uh, and then a, uh, a, a lessons learned, I think, from our, our friends abroad, uh, the, Anne, the Anne Solomon Center in Lima, Peru. So this, is, uh, this slide is meant to really illustrate uh, uh, what we know about autism epidemiology or prevalence uh, globally. Um, 
and obviously the one in 68 the CDC number and I think a new num new statistic will be released uh, very soon now um, and you see the the circle for uh, Mexico and then South Africa uh, India and Bangladesh uh, and as well as uh, Taiwan and uh, South Korea uh, these are all studies that have been uh, facilitated or funded by Autism Speaks and what we're trying to do is to uh, standardize some of the protocols so we are able to uh, have a better sense of better understanding of the prevalence of the of the condition worldwide and uh, but i think it's clear that you know there's tremendous knowledge disparity uh, relative to autism globally um, and uh, what you'll see is that uh, the the country where the uh, prevalence has been done really nicely overlap uh, this picture where the countries highlight in orange represent the uh, kind of countries uh, where like like the US and those in Western Europe uh, <clears throat> where most of the autism research and most of our knowledge about autism and uh, both in terms of uh, 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 needs throughout the lifespan and uh, and our standing in, in the community setting really came from uh, majority of our knowledge came from uh, these high income countries in other words we actually know very little about uh, about autism uh, in low resource community and, uh, and most importantly we have very little understanding in terms of how to best support uh, this individual family uh, in environment where there's low infrastructure uh, few specialists and certainly a profound lack of knowledge and understanding uh, continuing this trend globally uh, i think is is uh, is helpful to remind ourselves that out of 7.3 billion people worldwide, uh, one eight, almost 2 billion kids are under 14. Uh, and out of that, if you take 1% uh, uh, as a, as a uh, ASD prevalence, we're really talking about 18.2 million kids. Uh, and vast majority of these children live in uh, low income country where the treatment gap, uh, typical treatment gap is over 90%. Another trend globally that has really kind of in part a sense of urgency in what we do is really the success of this Millennium Development Goals. Millennium Development Goals were uh, uh, international development goals uh, that were uh, uh, established by the United Nations. Um, and these first set of goals was really meant to reduce, really focus on reducing uh, uh, mortality under five. And uh, so, so this particular target, this this graph really showed that many countries in the world had really uh, succeeded be, you know, beyond their wildest imagination. You're seeing you know, dramatic reduction in the 60, 70, 80% range. Um, so many, many more children actually are surviving uh, uh, past age five. But of course, um, with more children surviving um, uh, through age five, uh, I think simple math suggests that there will be more children with uh, developmental disorder, developmental disabilities like autism. And this is a graph of, uh, <laughs> for me, a hot moment uh, back in 2010, where a, uh, a AS funded researcher, Dr. Shreve Kochali, uh, in South Africa, explained to me how the decrease in mortality actually corresponds to increase in, in children with disabilities. And then finally, I think this is a, a salient uh, a point for, for our consideration. Uh, you know, as you know, um, there are many populations on the move now globally for various reasons, economic uh, strife, conflict, natural disaster. Uh, I think it's, it's in general, according to UNICEF, uh, one in seven people are migrants, uh, internal, ex external or internal, and 60% of the migrant children host in Asia and Africa. And, and this is a sobering thought. Uh, so family that, that stay in refugee camp, uh, for example, those in, in Syria, and, and those in East Africa before them, the average stay is 26 years. So it's easy to lose a couple of generations uh, in those settings. Uh, so imagine your family with a child affected uh, in, in an environment where, where all your uh, regular support system is, has been uh, disconnected and uh, you're trying to find ways to support your child development. So the develop. The development framework that we've, uh, uh, that we've facilitated over the past 10 years for our work uh, really started with uh, uh, some understanding about uh, you know, the variety of challenges that we face. It's not just about biology. And this is a, a, a slide from, uh, from Cape Town 2011 at the uh, Movement Global Mental Health Conference, where Vikram Patel, now a Harvard professor, uh, delivered a keynote uh, uh, 
talk really uh, talking about mental health and the social determinants of health. And so we know that you know health is more than just uh, biology. The things that we care about uh, in in autism, as well as you know health in general, um, you know are are uh, clearly affected by uh, these social determinants. Everything from economic stability, employment, to uh, 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 social integration, uh, to uh, uh, you know, early childhood education, and so on. So so these are elements that are. Uh, that contribute to the uh, overall outcome of our children and family. And it's so, that's why it's, it's a little surprise now that the uh, uh, US government is starting to take a serious look at the social determinant health and thinking about ways to integrate them into their electronic health record initiatives. Uh, and the benefits are obviously, uh, it's pretty obvious um, that potentially you can identify more effective treatment uh, and more effective population management and, and discovery of previously identified linkages. Um, I, I'm always reminded uh, of a comment uh, made by um, Shepard Cullum, uh, a uh, eminent prevention scientist from Johns Hopkins, uh, when he talked about asthma, a chronic condition, how uh, currently a, a social worker can do more to improve the quality of life and outcome of individual asthma uh, than medicine. So globally, there's a uh, pivot uh, to looking beyond survival, and uh, uh, and how do we make sure that children uh, are able to thrive uh, with uh, health and well-being, and and part of that is really about uh, transforming the environment, transforming the surrounding uh, that that support the development of the children. Uh, indeed, uh, the in 2016. United Nations issued a, a new set of global development goals for the next 15 years. It's called 2030 Agenda. And they're also called Sustainable Development Goals. And you can see that of the 17 goals here, they're all focused on uh, how to really uh, enhance development, enhance outcome of uh, individuals within community. And uh, of course, and, uh, many of these uh, 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 goals are, are very relevant to our community worldwide. For example, poverty, uh, goal number one, quality education, number four, uh, uh, decent work and economic growth. Uh, so these are all relevant and, and it's particularly important for our community because the, the overall thrust of the SDG is to leave no one behind. And uh, uh, you can see it's, it's not much of a stretch to say that, you know, uh, by, by meeting the needs of individuals and families affected by autism, uh, that you'll go a long way to meeting the sustainable development goals in general. Uh, here's a slide of some of the goals that are important for us. I, I mentioned already in previous slide. Uh, again, the point is that you cannot be achieved without inclusion of every member of society. Indeed, at, at the United Nations, uh, every April 2nd, uh, uh, we're also in Winter's Day, we, uh, we work with uh, uh, the permission of uh, uh, Qatar and, and Republic of Bangladesh. Uh, to host a high-level panel discussion. Uh, the reason these two member states are involved is that Qatar, uh, was both of those member states are responsible for often specific resolution at the United Nations. Uh, this is a, a flyer from uh, two years ago when we uh, actually uh, had a high-level panel discussion uh, to, uh, to discuss the sustainable development goal relative to autism policies and, and uh, programs and policy worldwide. So these are the... Uh, the resolution that was sponsored by the Qatar, uh, permission of Qatar and, and then Bangladesh in 2012. Uh, so the fact that we have a World Awesome Winners Day for April, April 2nd, uh, is really thanks to the, the efforts of uh, Qatar uh, working in collaboration with Austin Speech co-founder Bob and Suzanne Wright. Um, then in 2012, uh, working with uh, the permission of uh, public Bangladesh, uh, 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 along with uh, the daughter of the Prime Minister of uh, Bangladesh, uh, they were able to pass a, a second resolution of, uh, in the United Nations focusing on economic and uh, e economic needs of individuals, uh, families, and community affected by autism. And this picture represents uh, is actually the moment that the uh, resolution of 2012 uh, passed at the uh, General Assembly. And here's a picture of Simon Hussein, uh, the daughter of the Prime Minister of Bangladesh and her mother, uh, uh, Her Excellency the Prime Minister, at one of our uh, events in, uh, in New York. Uh, this is after the, the passage of the uh, Bangladesh Resolution. 
And both of those resolutions actually provide a framework uh, for what I think is probably the most significant resolution uh, for our community globally. And this World Health Assembly resolution that was uh, passed in March 2014. Uh, this uh, is really a re resolution specific for autism, and it really spells a strategy uh, at a community level, at a population level, for a comprehensive and coordinated effort for management of ASD. Um, I think it's notable that this, this resolution came on top of a uh, uh, overall mental health resolution in 2013. And uh, as one of the uh, uh, WHO principal uh, mentioned to me, this really, uh, I think, Example, for, I mean, really, I think, uh, communicate the, the political energy uh, that is involved with this issue globally at this point. Um, and this resolution, in some way, really kind of provide a roadmap uh, for the community looking at thinking about how to develop uh, uh, solutions for, uh, uh, for our community at a national level. Uh, and things I want to call your attention to is obviously to strengthen different levels of infrastructure, including care, education, support, and intervention service and promote sharing of best practice, knowledge, and technology. And then to identify address uh, and address disparities and access to services. Um, but there are many other things, uh, for example, providing social and psychosocial support to families, recognize uh, the contributed adult living with autism in the workforce. These are all very uh, contemporary issues and contemporary priorities that, that I think that we, that many of us think about on a daily basis. And uh, so, so this document itself really kind of provide some additional clarity in terms of uh, priority activities for uh, uh, for interested stakeholders globally. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is this. This is a WHO uh, service, mental health service pyramid. And I can, you can see that uh, on the left-hand side, uh, where the cost is high to low, and the right-hand side, you have the frequency of need, uh, again, from high to low, but they're inversely related. And what we're really trying to do is to focus on informal community care schools and non-special health worker and self-care. Because in these low resource, commun low resource community, as well as high resource community, these are oftentimes uh, the needs are, are unmet. These are the oftentimes the capacity that's missing within the community setting. Uh, many places, even in some of the poorest country, you have uh, uh, tertiary uh, special services and psychiatric hospital, but most of the time, uh, the numbers are few and far between, and so accessibility remains a, a major challenge for many of these uh, many of these communities. So the idea is by addressing the lower tiers of the pyramid, you can hopefully develop some capacity to provide uh, to enhance services and to enhance reach of your program and services. So the innovation that we're we're dealing with in this context is uh, really came from uh, uh, thinking about task sharing, uh, and for those of you. Um, uh, may know, uh, you know, task sharing now more called task, uh, formerly called task shifting, is a way to uh, build capacity by empowering non-specialists. And one of the seminal papers in this area was published in 2008, Lancet, by Atif Rahman and his colleagues from Liverpool. And uh, what they did is that they were able to uh, implement CBT, um, intervention in community health worker for mother with, with uh, postpartum depression. And it's a RCT, and what was, exciting about the particular study is that they were able to systematically adapt, uh, uh, I guess, a protocol or, or, or intervention that is uh, historically uh, administered by, by uh, trained specialists. And, uh, and because these non-specialists, and these are you know, uh, lady health workers who live in the community, uh, because they were able to leverage their shared lived experiences in their work, um, when you actually you do the assessment or the evaluation, the outcome is as good and sometimes better than what you see in high income country, comparable studies in high income country, uh, such as UK and Europe. So in, uh, <clears throat> um, so in 2015, uh, with funding from Author and Speaks, actually we started funding uh, uh, Dr. Rahman in 20, uh, 2014, actually. And, uh, and I'm sorry, 2013. And uh, he, um, he basically replicated the effort, uh, the task sharing strategy uh, on a uh, treatment naive community, um, but uh, using a uh, parameter intervention that developed by Jonathan Green and Com et al. Uh, in UK. And um, they adapt, the, the intervention is called PACT, and uh, it was systematically adapted by Jonathan and his team uh, to become PASS. And, uh, and they implemented this uh, randomized control trial funded by Austin Speaks in Goa, India, and Rawalpindi, Pakistan. 
And uh, what was exciting is that uh, even though this is a relatively small N, I think we're looking at uh, I think 70 uh, participant overall, um, they were able to clearly see uh, the effect the effect of the intervention. Um, and that uh, and uh, and an outcome is in addition to better um, you know better outcome for the for the affected child, the entire family seemed to be uh, positively impacted by the sense of empowerment and uh, being able to better support uh, the family members. So the task sharing is really a uh, rational redistribution of tasks among health work health workforce team, and the idea is that uh, specific tasks are moved where appropriate to highly from highly qualified health worker to those who are uh, less fewer qualification, less specialized. But in, in many communities, these non-specialists can, can really range from advocacy uh, to uh, 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 human adherence, psychoeducation, uh, social support, et cetera. So this has been a, um, uh, a really very uh, uh, effective, high-impact uh, uh, tactic for public health professional to help build capacity for services uh, in uh, some of these low and middle-income countries. And the work that we do in terms of building capacity is really uh, based on community-based participatory research, um, uh, CBPR, which, as you know, is, uh, is complement highly controlled academic research, but focused on practice in a community setting. And, um, and we involve community members, especially end users, in prioritizing research questions, as well as design implementation of the study. Uh, and, and just as significant, what we, what we always strive to do is to uh, share the outcome of the study with the community participants and, uh, and try to support their, their use of this information to inform policy development, implementation, of course, resource allocation. So we do all this in the context of uh, what Dan mentioned in the, his kind of introduction, uh, top of the hour here, the Global Awesome Public Health Initiative. And it received Global Health and Public Health Initiative, or GAF, as a global collaboration to enhance research, practice, and policy. Uh, and we do this primarily by supporting local leader to address local priority using locally customized solution. And we focus on public and professional awareness and advocacy, public health research, as a prevalent study, as well as tool development. And of course, um, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on service and policy development, dissemination, implementation. And of course, the advocacy leadership network on the bottom there is very much part of this, uh, this strategy uh, of this initiative. And here's some example of some of the work that we've done. Uh, in China, for example, where the LA member is, uh, is actually a government entity, a China Women's Young Foundation, uh, we have been supporting various uh, Chinese stakeholders in, in, their, uh, uh, in their efforts, uh, including, for example, uh, uh, in 2011, there's a national uh, science uh, research competition called 973, and autism was identified as one of the national priority, and Autism Speaks serves as a technical uh, advisor for that research team. Uh, we, similarly, we serve as technical advisor for Ministry of Health uh, to build capacity and actually uh, we brought in Eric Van Bon uh, to serve as advisor for a uh, national prevalence study. We should see publication by end of this year. Um, and in recent years, we've been working with uh, China Women Development Foundation to, to raise awareness for Wallace Awareness Day, Lila Blue, and, uh, and also now uh, working with them to uh, uh, develop parents' training program in, the, uh, uh, in China. Uh, of course, we, uh, we helped organize the first regional MFAR in Shanghai in 2015. And now we're doing, conducting a multi-site RCT uh, of the parent training program in, uh, in China. And from one of the largest countries in the world to one of the smallest in Albania, um, I see that you know, uh, we also did a range of work, uh, even though dramatically different from those in China, both in terms of scope and reach, uh, but they are important for the community in Albania nevertheless. We also work at a regional level uh, to try to take, a, take advantage of economy scale and, and uh, the political investments of stakeholders. Uh, this is one example uh, in the Southeast European region. And um, uh, with the help of the Millennium Ministry of Health, we're able to put together eight countries, um, health ministry for eight countries. Uh, the health coordinator uh, appointed by Ministries of Health, and we do annual meetings uh, to share information and resources. And, uh, and current project is actually a, uh, uh, a services research uh, survey uh, that we have um, uh, published. Initial, we, we had initial publication on last year, but we're actually uh, enhancing and adding more uh, uh, 
more survey questionnaires to uh, to better understand them and the meets in this community. So in uh, as of 2016, you know, actually as of 2016, we have a 76 country now uh, where we have some collaborative activity around the world. Uh, on pretty much every continent, we have something going on, and uh, it's been really gratifying to work with members of the ALN from 50, 52 countries, uh, support their leadership and their priority to make progress for our families in those territories. So now I'm gonna switch uh, to, uh, uh, to two examples, uh, a specific example in terms of the work that we do. Uh, the caregiver skill training, also known as uh, parent skill training, uh, it was recently renamed because uh, we recognize that uh, in many of these environments, uh, the caregiver for the affected child, it may not be the parents, but maybe a family member or, uh, or even a friend of the family. Um, so the idea of caregiver skill training is really, uh, I think it really uh, clarifies that the intended target uh, for the intervention are the uh, caregiver children with uh, the disability, developmental disabilities. So this is a cartoon that that's kind of summarizes the, uh, the PST program, the CST program. And these cartoons were, uh, were called from about 300 work that we commissioned by, uh, by artists from Brazil. And the idea is to use these illustration to, uh, uh, to support the lessons um, that they were trying to uh, provide in the community, especially for, uh, for caregiver with, uh, with uh, limited uh, literacy issues. But the idea is that it's a combination. Um, they meet every two weeks uh, for 10 group sessions, and they will, where they will reflect on their child's strengths and difficulties and, uh, uh, and share information and work on their personal goals. And the idea is that the facilitator described and shows like an educational strategy so um, they can learn together and, and support each other as they uh, try to implement some of these strategies. And, th and these group sessions are complemented by home visits uh, where they are using tailored intervention uh, for the, and coach caregivers. And uh, the idea is that these strategy are taught to promote development of com better communication skills, uh, adaptive life skills, and of course, uh, which could lead to inclusion and social engagement. So currently, the, the CST is being implemented in 30 countries worldwide. Uh, some examples. So, so, um, so what I do basically, I'm the salesman, right? So I go to country government, I try to pitch uh, the ministry uh, on what they should do, try to adapt a program like the CST. And in um, some examples of the country that are currently piling the and, and conduct uh, the, the the intervention include China, that's doing actually a multi site RCT involving eight uh, regional children hospital. Uh, South Korea, as mentioned earlier, uh, which is really largely uh, being uh, uh, spearheaded by Outside Society of Korea with funding support from the Korean government. In Malaysia, we're going through a different system there, uh, uh, working with uh, Southeast Asia uh, Ministry of Education organization. Uh, we're trying to implement the, the, PST, uh, the CST work in education setting, school setting, uh, as a, as the, uh, Minister of Education Cambodia uh, mentioned to me, you know, he has ambitious plans for his uh, for his country. Uh, he actually just established a uh, uh, division of special education for the first time in Cambodian country's history. Uh, this is a year a year ago actually, and they see the CSC as a tool that could harmonize uh, intervention support for children affected by autism in a school and home setting. Um, we have a, a RCT in Pakistan that's scale, uh, meaning that it's, it's done in a population, a community of a million, a million individuals, and about 3,000 families are actually involved in the RCT. Uh, in addition, looking at the effectiveness, we're, we're, more, we're very interested in looking at how this program could potentially be to, can be integrated to existing systems and services. And then last but not least, in the Jordanian, uh, the Syrian camps in, in Jordan and, uh, and, and Turkey now, we're working with uh, uh, organizations such as International Medical Corp and uh, Medicine Sans Frontier uh, to implement the CST in those community so that, so some of these skills can be portable with the families, uh, you know, whether they remain in the camp or, or re relocated to a new country, they have something that can, that the caregiver has something that can uh, continue to provide support for their affected uh, loved ones. So the CST program, uh, this is the basic structure. Um, uh, so WHOA's uh, team 
uh, we have a group of trainers uh, uh, in North America as well as in Europe. And we um, visit a country and we train a team of uh, master trainers. These are typically specialists who then train non-specialists or what we call program facilitators. Uh, is these program facilitator then, then go on to train the caregiver to deliver intervention to the children. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting model in the sense that you know, inter intervention at the end of the day uh, is actually being delivered by the family members. And uh, so it's really more kind of adult education that we're engaging in to give the caregivers and non-specialists in the community the necessary skill set to deliver, deliver and support the intervention. Uh, the intervention was, was uh, developed uh, with extensive community consultation. This is to, again, to highlight uh, the theme of this presentation, the importance of engaging community members. We started by, uh, in 2013, with a consultation in Geneva um, that clearly articulated the need for the PS or the CST. We had an extensive uh, systematic literature review, um, uh, tried to identify uh, what we think are, might be the best practices. There's a pre-development consultation in 2014 with limited number of external experts. Uh, the program was developed uh, internally in WHO and Austin Speaks. Um, I've been gone through uh, internal review, external review. In April 2015, we brought stakeholders from 18 countries around the world. These are some parents, uh, policymakers, professionals, and so on, to give us feedback. You know, is this feel feasible? Is this realistic uh, for implementation? And uh, with their guidance, we were able to uh, revise the material further and went for uh, external expert review again, and which generated the the, um, the, the field trial version. Uh, so this is a, a, a picture of all the uh, ALM members and, and, and others who joined us in Geneva to help us uh, understand, uh, 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 to help us develop the program further. So, so community engagement is very important in the planning process implementation of the, of the program um, because we're trying to really leverage uh, local resource and local expertise uh, for this work. And, uh, but we try to focus very early on uh, on key issues that, that will uh, uh, speak to the, the long-term sustainability of the program, the local context, uh, so and making sure that uh, there's opportunity to integrate the program uh, into the system as we, uh, as we find it. So there's various steps of adaptation that include qualitative research, uh, interviews, and uh, key informant interviews, and so on, um, that inform each rounds of adaptation. Um, after the initial adaptation, WHO office becomes in to provide five-day training for eight to 16 master trainers. And then the uh, master trainer will go and train the facilitators. Uh, and then they go into what is called a pre-pilot field test where the adaptation team members, including one master trainer, conduct a test run of the program uh, with about eight to 10 caregivers. So this is just to test the material to see, you know, is it feasible, is it susceptible, is there anything that will accept, accept, uh, upset anyone? Uh, or, or confusing to any of the caregivers. And then with the feedback we see from those uh, pre-pilot field tests, we uh, further refine the, uh, uh, the curriculum and then, uh, and then implement the pilot, but this time uh, with more caregiver and with monitoring evaluation framework built in. Uh, and of course, WHO Austin Speak Trainer will continue to be available for this support and consultation. So now switching gears a little bit. Uh, so obviously we're doing uh, a lot of this work trying to uh, build capacity to, to reduce the knowledge disparity globally. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, we're asked the question is that there's so many needs everywhere, right? And why are we um, investing uh, so much time and, and resources uh, uh, on environments where, in environments where they are extraordinarily challenging and a lot of times are not actually uh, not very similar to what we find in, in the U.S. or other, uh, other high-income countries. And I guess the argument there is that, you know, I, I think there's something to be learned. Um, you know, we can, we can help them and learn from them at the same time. Uh, because, you know, many of these um, advocates, professional, uh, are, are very creative and uh, innovative when it comes to finding solutions uh, in low resource and low capacity environment. And this is one story I wanna share with you, is the, Anne, the Center for Anne Sullivan, Center, Anne Sullivan Center in Lima, Peru. Uh, and this is Liliana Mayo, the founder director of the Anne Sullivan Center. 
Uh, she's been at this for about 35 years. <laughs> she started centering her parents' garage. It's almost like a tech, tech startup story, but it's really for uh, social program, social support. Um, uh, here's a picture of the center in Lima. And, uh, you know, the, the philosophy of the center is, is inclusion to life. So everything they focus on is really on inclusion, on adaptive skills. And that's kind of a, for me, it was interesting, was eye-opening because uh, most of the program visit, you know, there's emphasis on social communication and so on and so forth, um, behavior management. Whereas in Lima, in El Salvador Center, the emphasis is purely on uh, adaptive skills. Um, and the reason is because uh, um, uh, Lydia Mayo told me that is that the life expectancy, because their clientele are mostly uh, uh, poor families in, in Lima, Peru. Uh, so life is very harsh. And, and Liliana told me that she just got tired of going to funerals and then trying to figure out what to do with the kids, and a uh, funeral of the parents and trying to figure out what to do with the kids. So from a very early age, they emphasize adaptive skills. The target of their work is in home, community, regular schools, and workplace. Uh, they emphasize a functional and natural curriculum. And an interesting thing here uh, is that 70% of the effort need to be uh, from the families and 30% from the uh, from the center staff. And uh, each family uh, had to go through training every year. Uh, so you see that they actually spend a lot of time in training. Uh, classes held in CASP, homes and communities, and that the professional and the family team working together. So they talk about that a power of two. And they have high expectation, uniformly high expectation for every one of their students. Um, and, uh, and this has been a uh, enormously powerful and effective models in Lima, Peru. And I wanna highlight in particular um, uh, a program within the, the, the center is a support employment program. Now, as you know, you know, these days there's a lot of interest and, and focus on uh, a transition and adult, adult services, adult employment. And uh, frankly, I, I cringe every time people talk about best services in this area because as far as I know, there's very little, ev little evidence, right, to, to uh, support these claims of best practices. And, uh, and, and furthermore, I think, you know, these best practices may probably be at least, you know, currently only meaningful uh, in a high income country context um, and are probably not, probably not very relevant for low resource community where capacity infrastructure are both challenges. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, these programs are in the community. They are like, like this one, support employment program, you know, they've been around for a while. So even though there may not be evidence-based in a traditional sense that we think about it, the fact that they've been there for decades and they continue to succeed in placing individuals in the community, I think, you know, it suggests that there's something we can learn from, uh, from that practice. And indeed, if you take a look at the program, there's a lot of things uh, in this program uh, that, that are elements that we you know, highlight as, uh, as uh, critical, uh, as being critical or essential for the success of these kind of uh, 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 services program. So they started this uh, employment program in 1996 with six students. Now it's actually, this is a old slide, so they're actually several hundred students. Now, a big feature of the program is community cultivation. So you see in this, um, in this map on the right-hand side, uh, so CASP is right here, and you see that there's all these businesses all in the all neighborhood, KFC and so on and so forth. Um, they have high expectation for their students who are being placed in employment. Um, uh, their the expectation is for them to have eventually an independent, productive, and happy life. They focus on matching abilities and opportunities. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Practice, practice, practice. And, uh, and they emphasize same work, same pay. So it's not a charity. And the idea is that these individuals uh, who, are, uh, uh, you know, who are given this opportunity uh, will excel at their work and really add value to the employer, uh, employer's business. And then, the, of course, it's ongoing workplace support by, by cast members. This is a slide that they use to uh, uh, to pitch community stakeholders. So why do business employ them? Uh, they don't gossip, they ask for more work, they're loyal to the business, employ them. And of course the business also receives media uh, attention while doing so. This is a, a kind of a summary of the business that they, they've been working with in the community. You can see some of them go back to 1996, right? And uh, 
But what is striking for me about this particular slide is really the diverse range of business they've been able to place uh, their students in. From Wong, which is a supermarket, uh, to the Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Health, uh, and uh, multinationals such as Microsoft and PricewaterhouseCoopers and so on. Uh, so it really shows that you know there are opportunities for for uh, individuals on the spectrum in all areas of, of the society, in all types of employment uh, uh, situation. This is uh, just to give you a more uh, uh, personal example. Uh, we visited uh, Hosu, the, the architect Gomez and his family in Lima. This is where they live, um, very poor area of Lima. And uh, I walked into home and I almost had a heart attack because Hosu was actually working with his mother uh, using a very sharp knife to cut lime. Uh, so what they're doing is actually teaching Hosu to, to, to make lime, to contribute to the family business. Uh, the mother sells uh, 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 limeade on the, on the street corners uh, in Lima, downtown Lima. And so they're getting the uh, Hosu engaged in the family business from an early age. Hosu like to draw these, uh, I don't know if you can see very well, these uh, intricate patterns um, on tables. They like to line things up, and like many children. But Liliana's reaction is to call him the architect. Um, so the idea is that you know he sees she see these quote challenges as assets, and and these are opportun and points of opportunity for development uh, for these individuals. Here's a, uh, a gentleman, Sandro Lopez, who's been with centers for pretty much most of his life. Uh, uh, the top left corner is five years old. And then Sandro is 15 when he started working in Wong supermarket, uh, bagging, bagging groceries. And now he's a, his family's main breadwinner, and he's working at Alcoa uh, in, uh, in Lima. And actually, this is a sample of his work, uh, you know, how neat the handwriting is. Uh, they love him at Alcoa because, uh, you know, he's uh, uh, very reliable and, uh, and, he, and he's uh, very good at his work. This is a picture of three gentlemen on the spectrum at the Ministry of Health that we visited that day to provide, actually, Liliana visited that day to provide ongoing support. One of the gentlemen had an issue of uh, uh, flatulence, and so, so they went there to explain to the to gentleman, uh, you know, what is the proper etiquette uh, for, for, uh, for that bodily function. And of course, you know, the, the idea is that this will reduce uh, potential friction among employees and, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the ministry. Um, Luis Garcia is one of the gentlemen in the picture. He, his desk is right outside the central elevators of the, of the ministry. Extremely busy, you know, thousands of people go in and out a day. Luis's supervisor loves him because he said, no matter what happens around him, Luis is completely focused on his work. So this is just a few thoughts. Uh, you know, we clearly there's major disparity in knowledge and access to care, uh, both across and within the country. The best country practice of a high income country not necessarily feasible, sustainable, low income country. In the past 10 years, we have uh, done a lot in terms of developing a global framework um, in collaboration with stakeholders worldwide, uh, developed a global framework and really mobilize uh, uh, resources to help meet better, better meet the needs of our community. Community engagement really is a prerequisite for high impact research and development, especially uh, for relevance and feasibility. And that uh, they are informant. You know, these uh, families are informant, our teachers are co-investigator, implementation and the sustainability partners. And that there are opportunity to learn, to learn from them as they learn from us. And the idea is not to invent the wheel. And in the last minutes, I wanna show you this, um, God, I don't know if you can hear it. Uh, I hope so. This is a, a advertisement um, that was aired in you know, Lima TV. And so just remember, this is uh, uh, almost two decades old, right? But I want you to, to pay attention to the attitude, the tone uh, of this ad, and, and just recognize how progressive this is, right, relative to, to, to the US. Here we go.
And thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you uh, so Megan, much. Back to you. Oh, thank you. Yes, that was truly so wonderful to see some of the awesome work that you guys are doing all around the world. Um, we did get a few questions, so I'll, I'll start us off. I think this one might be from a parent, and it says, hello, Andy. I've already applied online with no response, so I was just wondering, how can I get more involved with the international work that you're doing with the WHO Parent Skills Training? Right, that's a great question. Um, so at this point, our engagement uh, with the global community is uh, mainly uh, through the ministries, because uh, right now, uh, a necessary part of this process is to adapt the core material, core curriculum, uh, so that it's culturally competent and appropriate for local uh, uh, infrastructure and, and capacity and resources. Um, so right now, it's, it's very still very much of a research effort at this point. It's implementation science, for sure. Um, but what we hope is that uh, once we're able to have a, a, a develop a version that's appropriate for, for each of these community, then we'll be able to broaden our, our interaction and bring in more stakeholders to help disseminate implement. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and one other question was, um, do you have an idea about some interventions or things that might be upcoming in the future to address um, what you mentioned at the beginning, the fact that we do have so many families that are refugees right now and um, people who are emigrating and moving to different locations. Do you? Um, no, for moving in a direction to help these families who have kids on the spectrum and stuff like that. Yeah, so so that's a great question too, and and I think you know I I, I try to um, you know highlight the potential for the caregiver skill training program in these particular contexts. You know the the capacity is a major challenges a major challenge globally for our community. The idea is that most of the quote, best practices we have now that, are, that were developed originally in high-income countries like Western Europe and North America, uh, as I mentioned, are, are difficult to implement and sustain uh, in, in an environment where, you know, very few specialists uh, and, uh, and uh, certainly no, you know, not, there's the lack of robust uh, public health system to support uh, this kind of services. So the idea of, of taking so I think this is actually a general shift in terms of strategy by even by organization like uh, WHO and UNICEF. If you look at uh, UNICEF um, a health strategy for 2030, you know, there, there is a tremendous emphasis on community engagement, on building capacity through non-specialists and caregivers. Um, because I think the idea is that uh, those represent cost-effective opportunity to uh, make access available, uh, access to evidence-based intervention available uh, to as many families as possible within the community. And there's a, so there's a, a move away from reliance of specialists and, and uh, an existing uh, health system or, or service system uh, to meet the needs of our community. So I think in that, in that context, uh, with all these uh, task shifting and task sharing strategy being implemented, I think that's where we can really try to address the needs of these uh, underserved population, uh, like the refugees, like the migrants, uh, and uh, uh, like families, you know, poor families in, in, in the U.S. Those are, you know, with 200%, uh, below 200% federal poverty guideline, for example. Um, you know, they, they face very similar challenges here. And, but we think that, you know, by empowering caregivers with actionable knowledge, uh, we might be able to alleviate some of the, the challenge and difficulty faced by these families. Yeah, thank you so much. That makes sense. Um, okay, another question. Um, does the Ann Sullivan Center in per Peru deal with the same type of legal regulatory issues with companies that employ or train individuals with ASD? This seems to be a, one of the barriers here in the U.S. Yeah, so the short answer is no, but they have other issues they have to deal with. Um, so, so I think the general approach that you know 
that um, Dan Sullivan had taken uh, is really, I mean, the, you know, Lady Anna Maya was trained in Kansas, you know, University of Kansas, special education department. So she has this grounding in special education. But, you know, her approach is actually very public health, you know, oriented. And the way she thinks about engaging community and so on, these are concepts that were at, at least, you know, 10, 15 years ago was ahead of time. Right now, where we talk about community-based participatory research and so on and so forth, this is what the center has been doing all this time. And I think that I think they represent an opportunity for uh, for community here, right? To think about, you know, there's one one thing that that you know that, that's often challenging for me to think about, you know, residential solution for or community solution for adults with autism. You know, many many parents now trying to develop, uh, you know, specialized residence solutions or special community living solutions. Um, to me, I, I think they're wonderful, right? I mean, they're, I mean, some of these facilities are terrific, but you know, to me, I can't help but to feel that you know, in doing so, even though it's well intentioned, you're you're actually working against more inclusion of these individuals in the community. And the things I worry about, you know, for example, you know, these specialized, uh, 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 you know, communities, uh, residential arrangements. I mean, how is that sustainable, you know, in the longer term? You know, if, if the government ends up funding this, supporting this, um, you know, in the longer term, maybe that's helpful. But at the end of the day, you're still kind of excluding them from them, from mainstream life, right? You're, you're providing an environment for them that is segregated uh, from the mainstream. So anyway, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but, but I think you know, the idea here is that um, the model that we have learned from Ann Solomon Center, I think is applicable not only to other low resource, uh, low middle countries in the world. As a matter of fact, you know, this model has now been replicated in Panama and has been also replicated in Dominican Republic. Um, so, the lessons we can learn from these uh, uh, low, low resource community can actually teach us something about efficiency, effectiveness, and the importance of cultivating your community to provide a support for the family. Um, it's not any one particular party or stakeholders in the community, but the idea of trying to identify a place, an opportunity uh, to support these family for every stakeholders in the community. Thank you so much um, for that answer and for your presentation as a whole. I think we're gonna have to close it out right there. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Shear. That was truly, really, it was so great to see what's going on um, in the autism world in general and what Autism Speaks is working on specifically. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, please tune in next month. If you know someone who missed this presentation or you wanna come back to it, it'll be up on our um, YouTube site. Thank you so Thanks. much, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. Everyone have a great week. Bye-bye.